Welcome, everyone. Welcome to another evening of Science Safety. Today, we're going to discuss safer strategies for the December holiday closures in your school. And of course, this is part of the ongoing professional safety education webinar series facilitated and presented to you uh, from Science Safety. With me, of course, is Dr. Ken Roy. I'll introduce him in just a moment. Tonight, we are going to be uh, discussing, and it'll be mostly Dr. Ken tonight. I know that's who you're here to uh, see and listen to. Ah. But both of us are here, uh, Dr. Ken Roy and myself, James Palsik. We are those uh, recognized uh, academic and practical safety educators in multiple program areas across the STEM disciplines. We are aware of and knowledgeable uh, about legal safety standards, better professional safety practices, in order to help you meet your compliance and professional objectives. Now, tonight's session is very special to both Dr. Ken and myself because, yes, it is the end of the calendar year. It is not the end of the school year, so safety still must uh, uh, continue. And as that winter weather and holiday time approaches, well, we know that students and teachers and principals and the extended families, everyone's looking forward to that holiday break. And we can reflect on the year and celebrate with friends and family. However, there are some potential safety concerns that should be addressed before school closes. That way, when you do return in the new year, it is nice and smooth and it is a safer instructional space for everyone to come back to. Now, that being said, the four main topics tonight are responsible chemical management, general housekeeping, dealing with your plants and animals over the holidays, and engineering controls and safety equipment. This is really going to be the, the kind of the, the four main pillars that are discussed tonight. And we encourage you to incorporate what you hear into your monthly departmental meetings. And that way that will spread that information uh, across all of your peers as well. And let's face it, uh, we are going to be jumping in right now with Dr. Ken and myself and we want you to ask those questions, please post them into the chat box and we'll either answer them live right away or we'll save them until the end where we have the open forum Q&A. Now it is my distinct privilege and pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Ken Roy, who is the Dep uh, Director of Environmental Health and Safety, the Chemical Hygiene Officer, the CHO, the Designated Asbestos Compliance Coordinator, the PCB Program Coordinator, the Silica Compliance Coordinator, all for Glastonbury Public Schools in Connecticut. And if that wasn't enough, Dr. Ken is also the Chief Safety uh, Compliance Advisor, Chief Safety Blogger for the uh, National Science Teaching Association, NSTA, as well as for NSELA, the National Science Education Leadership Association. And in Dr. Ken's free time, and I love saying that, in his free time, he's already authored 13 science and STEM safety books and over 850 safety articles, all in professional journals and associations, uh, NSTA and SELA, Council of State Science Supervisors, ITEEA, and many, many more. He is renowned as the godfather of safety education in STEM all across North America. That's your new title, I'm branding you that way. Yeah, dude. <laughs> and I am James Palsik. I am the Chief Executive Officer uh, for Science Safety. I'm also a show host on the Safer Ed program found on Ed Circuit. I'm the former General Manager and Director of Education, Safety and Compliance for Flynn Scientific. I've of course only offered, or authored three science and STEM safety books, not 13, only three, uh, for the Council of State Science Supervisors, but I have authored multiple chemical hygiene plans for school districts all across the land. I'm a safety reviewer for the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics, which is a renowned global think tank, and I've appeared on 150, uh, more than 150 podcasts, and written articles on science education, safety, and better professional practices in science, STEM, and CTE, many of which you can find on edcircuit.com. Wonderful. Now that we've talked about ourselves, Dr. Ken, welcome to the program, and I'm giving you the controls, my man. It's your show now. 
Wow, thank you, JP. <laughs> uh, again, I also want to welcome everyone uh, taking time out of your busy, busy day this evening to really tune into something that's sometimes overlooked. But you're not overlooking it because you're here, and that's great, right? And let's all get down to it and do it. And again, remember, if you have questions, go to the chat, put them in there, and JP will funnel them out here, and we'll take a look at them. So chemical inventory management, least we forget. Ensure that there is an accurate chemical inventory. <clears throat> a 10-year-old inventory is not accurate. I can't tell you how many times I go and do mock OSHA inspections in the school district, and I look the last time the inventory was done, oh, five years ago, 10 years ago. Some go back to the lab standard or even before uh, their OSHA. I mean, this, this is not accurate, okay? Accurate means up to date. So when maintaining the inventory, any chemicals that exceeded their shelf life, very important. In other words, most chemicals have lifespans. Right. Some have longevity, some do not. Right. And you need to be aware of that before you purchase them. Uh, they need to be disposed of proper disposal procedures found in your SDS for that particular chemical. Very important. In fact, there are some instances if they're forgotten in the back of the shelf and you notice, for example, crystal growth or uh, the labels are falling apart. That's a red flag. Don't touch it, right? You should not touch it because the chemical is telling you something. Stay away or you're going to regret it, right? So what you want to do certainly is get help from your local fire department uh, or your state the Department of Labor, whichever is available. There should be an SDS for every chemical, every chemical in the inventory on site. And these need to be kept for 30 years for legal purposes. All right, 30 years. Don't shred them just because you get rid of the chemical. You keep the SDS. Any chemicals that have broken lids or damaged vessels, bottles must be dealt with immediately. Not yesterday, but now. All right. Any liquid spilled must be contained and handled in accordance with the chemical hygiene plan, chemical spill safety protocol. So again, this is all this should be going on not just now, <clears throat> but from beginning to end of your academic year and beyond, all right? Even during vacation time. That's one of the reason we're, we're doing this tonight, just to make you aware of these things, and things you cannot forget to do. Okay. Before the last day of school year, please ensure that all chemicals are returned to their proper storage location as per your approved chemical storage system in your school. Now, by last day of school year, we're also talking certainly before a holiday break. If you have a week or two off, same deal. If your school's not going to be in session, you need to take care of these things. Ensure that if any bottles have broken caps, need labels, that these are appropriately handled prior to leaving for the holiday season. You don't leave chemicals, especially unlabeled ones in the lab. In many school districts, the local fire marshal finds that as a great time to walk along and go through the labs and guess who's it? You'll be it, but even more so your superintendent or ever overseeing your school. And actually they can be fined by the fire marshal. That's, you're not gonna have a happy boss if that happens. So do not leave chemicals on mobile carts or open countertops until you return in January. This is a serious chemical concern and a potential NFPA, that's the fire code, that's the fire potential association uh, violation. Chemical hygiene plan. Ensure that all members of the science and STEM departments have access, access to a current chemical hygiene plan, which contains the necessary standard operating procedures, SOPs, for responsible chemical management in the school. This is for science and STEM departments and managed by your designated CHO, chemical hygiene officer. <clears throat> Other departments will use a hazard communication plan or HASCOM. Uh, standard, such as arts, CTE, cosmetology, agrosocial science, and others have access to potentially hazardous materials during the course of the workday. Nowhere near the level or the complexity that you have in science or STEM. But nevertheless, 
they are there, hazardous chemicals, and they need to be addressed. Though it's under a different OSHA standard. For information, your chemical hygiene plan needs to be reviewed at least minimally annually. Please ensure that it's been edited at least once in the previous 12 months to be compliant with OSHA Code of Federal Regulations 29, that's General Industry 1910, 1450 is the laboratory standard. Chemical safety cabinets and storeroom doors. Ensure that your chemical cabinets are locked for the duration of the holiday closure. Do not leave them unlocked. If you leave them unlocked, that provides access. You don't want access to someone else. Trust me, you're looking for a lawsuit if somebody gets hurt. If they break in, that's a different story, right? So it must be locked. And that all properly labeled chemicals contained are in their appropriate storage bottle with fitted cap or lid. Do not store incompatible chemicals in the wrong cabinet. In other words, storing flammables in a flammable cabinet and not in a corrosive cabinet. <clears throat> Keep chemical storeroom and prep room doors locked always, as well as the added layer of security for your equipment, apparatus, chemicals, and other STEM materials. Only authorized and safety trained staff should have access to these areas in the school due to the hazards present. Now, if during the holiday, custodial staff are going in there to clean. They need to have been trained at least minimally in the HAZCOM, right? In other words, dealing with hazardous chemicals. Again, if they get hurt in there because you left some chemical out, you're it legally. You don't want to be there. Please make sure everything is locked up so it's safer for those people going in to do the cleaning and the like. Okay. Dr. Ken, we have a question specifically about the prep room doors, and I love it. I know the answer, but I'm going to ask you the question. I'm going to, I think this is a good one for you. Dr. Ken, every teacher in my school uses a master key, so that means they can open the prep room door if it's locked. Do you think that is a good or a bad idea? Oh, I love that question. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't say it's a dumbass idea because that would be inappropriate, but it is. <laughs> Trust me, the problem is the administration now is on the hook, as you would be if, let's say, for example, the English teacher decides to go in there and have lunch and wanders around and gets hurt, right? Your laboratory, your prep room, and your chemical storage room should be unique keys only to those that have been trained in the laboratory standard. Got that? Again, only those that have been trained in the laboratory standard right? Nobody else. That's absolutely ridiculous to have the whole school having access to that. Legally, that, that, that's not appropriate. Not only as a better professional safety practice, but also as a legal safety standard. OSHA very specifically tells you you must secure these areas. Secure means lock doors. Okay. Hey, thank, thank you for your answer. I think you answered that appropriately, Dr. <laughs> Ken. Thank you. Waste. Ah, that's the end of the trail, hopefully. In other words, you decide on what you're going to buy. You ultimately buy it. You store it. You use it. But then you have to get rid of what's left behind. And by getting rid of it doesn't mean you store it in the back on a shelf somewhere. Follow local guidance from your chemical hygiene plan, also an environmental hygiene plan in non-OSHA states about the procedures for storing chemical waste. Act your local chemical hygiene officer or OHS director, Occupational Health and Safety, about what to do with these accumulated chemical wastes over school closure. Please, school closure. That means annually. That doesn't mean every 10 years. Annually, end of the school year. Follow local municipal guidance and local state fire codes and federal EPA rules related to safer storage and handling of these waste items in science or STEM departments. Ensure these wastes are labeled and stored appropriately. And here's a little advice. Anything, communication, dealing with getting rid of hazardous waste, put it in writing to the administration, include the chemical hygiene officer and your supervisor. But please, Put it in writing. Unfortunately, sometimes administrators get brain mets 
Oh, I don't think we ever talked about that. I'm, I've heard it all, trust me. <clears throat> and then you say, well, yeah, sure we did. Here's the email. <clears throat> Okay. And you should also you should also include that communication with your chemical hygiene officer as well. Right. That's because, what I said. Good. Yeah. Well, I know. Now, Ken, what if there is not a designated chemical hygiene officer? What would you do in that case? You're in violation. <laughs> well, yeah, well, the the school district. Well, you need be, to. Yes. You, what you need to do is you need to contact the school administration. Uh, I would also ask. You want to take a look at board policy. I am sure almost every school district I've ever done work for, the Board of Education has always had a policy stating that they will be uh, following NFPA codes, OSHA codes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that's very strong uh, thing that you might want to share with the administration. Having done that, and then you put it in writing that you shared it because they'll be it. Trust me, when it's in writing, they don't want to be it. And you'd be surprised how quickly. Now, there is a little catch with this. If they do not have an assigned chemical hygiene officer, OSHA states by default, the superintendent of schools, the superintendent of schools will serve as the chemical hygiene officer and have those responsibilities. Well, that's nice if they were a previous science teacher, but if they were a math teacher, language arts, uh, world language, uh, you, you can see where we're going with this. It's going to be bad news. But you might want to remind the superintendent uh, that, in fact, they are. You can pose questions and say, you know, it's my understanding. OSHA says the superintendent of schools, by default, since we don't have anybody assigned, by default, you're it. And I have some questions I, I need answered by you. <laughs> it's a very powerful tool. Trust me when I tell you this. Very good. And I'm going to throw in one more little piece here. If you have biological specimens that you need to, that are part of your waste disposal, <laughs> those also need to be identified, labeled, and should be dealt with correctly, and not just left out on the side of the, the lab for an extra two weeks. Speaking about leaving it out, um, there are, I'm sorry, I couldn't help myself. Uh, there are three basic kinds of hazards, all right? We've talked about the chemical. JP brought to light here. We also have biological, and we also have physical hazards, okay? So those are the three areas. So even though the laboratory standard primarily focuses on chemical hazards, all right, you really should have this written as a safety plan that incorporates not only chemical, but biological and physical hazards. So it's very, very important that those three areas are addressed. Because you, again, you don't want to be caught with something that you were responsible for and you didn't let the administration know. Trust me, been there. All right, thanks, man. You're welcome, man. Okay, general housekeeping. <coughs> Excuse me. Housekeeping, Very, another OSHA standard. Housekeeping. In order to return to a clean, tidy, and organized department in the new year, there are a handful of standard operating procedures that should be followed to ensure a smooth and safer school opening. These are simple tasks that will make your January return much simpler and safer for you and your students. Make sure your laboratory instructional spaces and related areas like your preferring chemical storage um, are kept neat, tidy, and organized. There should be a daily event, not once a week, once a month, once a year, daily, right? You don't want any trip, fall, slip, fall hazards, um, you name it, bad. There should be a daily event, not only before school is closed for two weeks in December. Um, really important. Housekeeping is, and the other thing is, if kids see that you're a hoarder, you don't give a rat's ass how messy it is, do you think that they're not going to follow your lead? Absolutely. So you keep it tidy bowl, keep it clean, and you enforce it with them also, because that's how they're going to learn. They need to learn from you. Okay. They definitely do model the uh, the behaviors that they ah, see read their instructors. More than teachers ever realize. It's as simple as if the if the teacher wears their goggles, 
the students all miraculously put their own goggles yep. on. It's, yep. it's great. <coughs> Glassware and neatness. Ensure that glassware is placed safely back on the cabinet or shelf where it belongs, <clears throat> not left on the countertops and mobile carts over the school closure. Again, everything, equipment, materials, chemicals, bio -op, everything must be locked, secured. Wash any test tubes, beakers, cylinders, burettes, specialized glass, or another lab where items are returned to their storage location for use in January. Dispose of any broken glass in a dedicated, you don't throw in the regular trash. Trust me, I couldn't tell you how many custodians I have seen stick their hands in there going through it looking for goodies, and then all of a sudden they're bleeding, right? Uh, approved broken glass box. Inspect the glassware you have and dispose of all scored or cracked glass since there is a preventable hazard. Yes, and having a, a five gallon plastic pail with broken glass in it and broken burettes poking out of it is unacceptable. No, nope. that cannot happen. That is a, a serious infraction. Do not do that. Spend a couple of dollars and get the commercial uh, broken glass boxes with the vinyl liners in them. It is a, a health and safety requirement. This is not a recommendation. Nope. Sorry, Ken, I get passionate about that one. <laughs> I see you even shatter the glass. Okay. I did. <laughs> uh, moving right along. <laughs> Appropriate PPE for all, all occupants. That includes the teacher, not just students. And then, trust me, I've seen that. All right. Um, this includes indirectly vented chemical splash bottles meeting the ANSI ISEA Z87.1D3 standard, which must be worn when handling hazardous chemicals or biological liquids that have the potential to splash. If it's something that can splash, safety goggles, okay? Not safety glasses, safety goggles. Goggles or safety glasses with side shields must have side shields, can be used when working with physical hazards, power tools, hand tools, springs, glassware, projectiles, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Nitrile gloves and non-latex Lab aprons or laboratory coats appropriate for the materials shall be worn when using chemicals, biologicals, heated items, certain tools. The use of hand protection in school science STEM instructional spaces usually mean appropriately sized nitrile gloves for all occupants of the lab. For specific hazardous chemical PPE requirements, consult ah, safety data sheets, section eight <clears throat> for appropriate PPE use. Make sure PPE fits people in the room. That's important also. You want to make sure the glove, if they have an extra large palm and you're just giving them a regular and it doesn't fit and then it stretches it and it rips the glove, no, that doesn't work. These are available different sizes for a reason. True. You can't have medium sized t shirts for your baseball team. There you, you go. Have people in different sizes accommodate that. Science. STEM departments during the holidays. OSHA's housekeeping standard notes that employers shall establish and maintain good housekeeping practices to eliminate hazards to employees, including floor walkways. This has applications for holiday laboratory floor cleaning by custodial staff. Remember to make sure all chemical supplies, appropriate lab equipment are stored correctly in cabinets and shelving off of the floor in laboratories, preparation rooms, and storerooms. Seems to be an ongoing thing with this that we keep repeating over and over and over because it's true and it's to protect you and your students and custodial staff. <clears throat> this will dramatically reduce potential fall hazards and resulting risk for custodial staff getting seriously injured. In addition to OSHA's housekeeping standard training, make sure the custodial staff has been trained. Ah, this is what I said, has come, okay? When working around hazardous chemicals in these areas, this, in fact, would require you to use of appropriate personal protective equipment like splash goggles, gloves, et cetera. Very important. Yeah, and I, I want to re-emphasize, do not leave chemicals on the floor. Just do not do that. <laughs> it, it, it is such a preventable hazard when that happens. We had a case in a town of West Hartford here in Connecticut several decades ago. Chemistry teacher, on a Friday afternoon, rush, 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 trying to get out, has a bottle of concentrated hydrochloric acid, right? 
hurry in a hurry, goes in the chemical storeroom, can't find room on the shelf, puts it on the floor behind the door, leaves. Half hour later, custodian comes in, cleans the lab, and also decides to clean, guess what, the chemical storeroom. Opens the door, the bottle of acid falls over, the cap was loose, he didn't, the teacher didn't even tighten the cap, it leaks out. Monday morning, they find the custodian dead, that's not breathing, baby, on the floor, and his face, chest, eaten up like you can't believe by the acid. Totally preventable. Um, as far as I'm concerned, not only should the teacher lost a job, should have been arrested, because basically he killed this guy. Okay. <laughs> animal care over the holiday. Another important piece here. Animals have inherent needs. Ah, food, water, warmth, light, some unique needs for waste management. Oh, yeah, and cleaning. Some people will allow their classroom animals to spend a holiday with a student or a teacher in return in January, which is fine. Just make sure you get parent permission if you're going to send it to students. If your animal, reptile, arachnids, or other live organisms require daily attention, some arrangements need to be made to accommodate your animal during closure to keep them healthy alive until you return. In other words, this is if they're in the lab. Make sure that you over-communicate the special and unique care instructions for your animals to the provider if you're not doing this yourself. Very important. These animals are at your mercy. They really, really are. You're right. They are. And uh -huh. certain jurisdictions don't even allow them in the in the lab anymore. <laughs> yep. And the ones that do, they should really protect that privilege yep. and use those forms, as you say, and really over communicate that you can't take that animal home or that reptile home and leave it and go on holidays for a week yep. yourself. Yeah. Sometimes exactly. people just don't think. And I'm not just talking kids. I'm talking adults. But let's also talk about the plants because there are ah, those yes. those. Plant care. There are some simple requirements for plants in the department over December closure. Ensure the plants have, oh yes, adequate water or moisture when you leave and for the duration of the closure. Now, you just got to be a little bit careful about high levels of moisture because... It, that would facilitate mold growth if there are spores, and I'm sure there are. So please be careful. Don't overwater things. It's better to have someone come in like yourself several times during that vacation than just swamping them. Ensure that plants will receive adequate sunlight while the school is closed. Understand the needs and ensure that they are met for the plant in your laboratory instructional spaces. Ensure that the temperature in the room will not be too cold for plants. You know, schools, you know, they're trying to save bucks. So they'll shut the heat way down, like in the 50s, sometimes even the 40s, I found it. Uh, and that's if they're operating appropriately. Many schools turn down the HVAC when the schools are closed to save money. Some plants require special food on a routine schedule, which must be met even during closure periods. If you want to come back and find them alive. This is true. <clears throat> Engineering controls to inspect in December. These safety control measures have been built in as infrastructure in the instructional space, laboratories, classrooms, including goggle sanitizer, fire extinguishers, fire blankets, master console switches, eye wash stations, drench shower, uh, ground fall, GFCI outlets, machine guards, machinery, equipment, tools, etc. All critical. Engineering controls, again, make it safer and our requirement legally to have in your laboratory instructional space and even your classroom in some instances. So it's very important to make sure that these things uh, are checked out. And it, this can be by custodial staff, whatever. I would uh, suggest that you give a list to your head custodian just so to make sure that they see that things are in order. Yeah, that UV goggle cabinet, that's one that a lot of people uh, forget about. But definitely look in that little uh, peephole to make sure that that purple blue light is on. That's how you test that that's fully functional. Uh, fire extinguishers, make sure there's no obstructions, right? 
Make sure that the gauge is in the full uh, uh, charge position, not under or over. Make sure the tags are all, all current. Make sure the fire blanket is there. Uh, master control switches, my personal favorites, make sure that they're, they're working. Some of them are keyed, some of them are locked. Uh, make sure that they are fully functional. Eyewash stations, as a friendly reminder, you do need to run your eyewash at least five minutes every week. That is a ANSI requirement. That is not something that Dr. <laughs> Ken and I made up. That is a a, a, a requirement. And the and drench OSHA, shower, OSHA, by the way, let me just interrupt very quickly. OSHA has also adopted that ANSI standard. So yes. it is a legal, it's not only better professional safety practice, it's also a legal safety standard. Yes, it is completely recognized. So you're and right, it's legal. If, if you notice any of these things are not operating the way they should be in writing, work order, you make sure you put that in. Unfortunately, however you want to look at it, as the teacher, you are the one that's charged with safety in the laboratory, all right? There is some shared liability, but not much relative to the teacher. The teacher is the one who decides if it's safe or not, not the administration. If the teacher says, you know, this is not working, I, we cannot do labs, it is unsafe. The administration has no authority to override that, right? That's not legal. And sometimes they need to be reminded of that by your yes. union, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you, you, you are right. They do need those gentle reminders or yes. firm reminders sometimes. Yeah. In writing, don't forget. Of course. Yeah. Okay. And those machine guards never operate any machinery, three, whether it's 3D printers or it's it's tools and equipment in, in maker spaces or fab labs or in CTE programs. Never, never, never if any of that guarding is removed ever. Or, or cracked. Or or damaged. Yes, cracked, or damaged. Or damaged. Exactly. Exactly. But yes, you are absolutely 100% spot on that engineering controls should be checked religiously often, but especially at the end of the school year so that if those work orders do need to go in, they can be remedied before everyone returns yep. in January. Sorry, Ken, I got all excited there. <laughs> all right, calm down, calm down. <laughs> I wash the drench showers. Maybe you need a drench shower. Anyway, legal safety standards and better professional safety practice require the testing and running of eyewash station water weekly. At least weekly. I've heard some places, they say, oh no, it's a monthly. No, it's not monthly, weekly is to ensure that there is no sediment or stagnant water contained in the plumbing system in case it needs to be used in an emergency. You know, there, there's chemical and biological hazards that can be in those water pipes. You don't want that going in your eye, right? Not good. Uh, in December, it's a good idea to examine the units, ensure they're in good working order and that the service inspection tags are current. If they are out of date, notify your school administration by email and insisted they are ready for the return to school in January. Very important. Fume hoods. Ensure that prior to school closure in December that all, notice, capital A-L-L, -L, materials are removed from the worked out in the fume hood. It should be free of clutter, right? Housekeeping, remember? Housekeeping and material. This includes chemicals or chemical waste in some schools leaving the fume hood. No, chem no chemicals, no biologicals, right? Chemicals should not be left on the work services overnight. Absolutely not. And especially not over an extended closed, a closure period like the holiday break. Make sure to close the water and natural gas valves and set sash height to optimum level before leaving for the holiday season. If there are any issues, send an email to the building administrator advising that the fume hood must be inspected. Now, <coughs> Having said that, it is a legal requirement through the NFPA that that fume hood be appropriately, and there's a standard that they have, the NFPA 45 standard. There are things you must have a formal inspection once a year, usually at the end of the school year, 
So if things need to be repaired. They can be before school starts at the beginning of the year, right? Uh, if your school's not doing that, you're going to put something in writing to the facilities, uh, your administrator, your supervisor, and your chemical hygiene officer to make sure that those things are done, right? And there should be certain signage put on the side telling when this was done, who did it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? You don't want to be caught in having an accident and the thing not having been inspected appropriately. Fire safety, you should inspect your fire safety items, including the fire extinguishers, fire blankets, bugs of dry sand found in the science STEM departments. Ensure that the inspection tags are up to date on the fire extinguishers, very important. In notifying and notifying the school building principal and maintenance personnel about any possible missing tags or expired tags for immediate remedy. Immediate, that means like yesterday. <clears throat> you don't, they shouldn't tell you, oh yeah, we'll do it in the, during the next month. No, unacceptable, right? Make sure that these fire safety items are always accessible. No obstructions are cluttered and interfere with access in emergency situation, right? You'd be shocked how many times I go in the lab and there's all kinds of equipment, all kinds of other kinds of crap in front of the fire extinguisher, right? You probably need a GPS to find where the extinguisher is. I mean, it's just craziness, right? No, please, no obstruction. <clears throat> Drains, again, another important piece. Sink drains and floor drains and science STEM departments can benefit from a cup of water poured on them, school closure. This will prevent sewer gas uh -huh, from being able to pass the P-trap system in the drain if they are allowed to operate dry, not being used. Uh, the liquid can evaporate, allowing sewer gas, hydrogen sulfide, for example, to enter the laboratory. Trust me, you'll know when it's happening. Woo! This is also a great opportunity to identify if there are any foreign items in the drain that can be removed by maintenance or facility teams. Again, very important, make sure. And in fact, if you have a sink behind uh, the instructional space and you notice that it's never being used, I would even put a cup down there maybe once a week. Um, doesn't hurt, it's very helpful. <laughs> dishwasher. Uh, dishwasher. Run the dishwasher and empty the contents prior to leaving the holiday closure. Don't leave items in the dishwasher for two weeks. Two weeks. I've seen it in there for six months. Lab refrigerator. Look at what is in the lab and or prep room fridge and decide whether it is worth keeping or not. No food or drinks kept in the lab and or prep room fridge. All right. That is for non-food, in other words, for chemical, biological items only. You need to have a separate refrigerator with signage on it saying food for eating only. Make sure that there's a sign indicating posted on the refrigerator door. Right, just like that nice image you, oh, you nice. provided to us right there. No yep. food or drink to yep. be stored in this refrigerator. Right. Yep. Perfect. That's perfect. Love it. And Dr. Ken, we're coming towards the end here, but don't worry, there's still the active Q&A component. <laughs> now our, our exclusive trusted partner with Science Safety, that is Accelerate Learning, and we've partnered together <laughs> to provide access to safety solutions and services all across the K-12 educational space in the United States. Now Accelerate Learning is the exclusive partner for our products, and together we are making schools safer through education and awareness. Please contact Accelerate Learning. Those are the folks with STEM scopes uh, for more information or to schedule a conversation. There we go. We've done that. And now there we go. There's some of the, the uh, references that were used tonight. As well, my favorite part of the evening, it's questions for the presenters. Ken, I have three questions in here if you still have time yet. Yeah, I have three. Do you still have some time? I could have asked them during the, I the session, but I felt I would hold on to them until the end because they were that for good. These, for these participants, absolutely. <laughs> Wonderful. So, Dr. Ken, question one is, how often should members of the science department be safety trained? <laughs> <laughs> Minimally. 
minimally once a year, and that is to review any changes that have taken place in the chemical hygiene plan. Uh, it's also for individuals that have different assignments. In other words, let's say you taught biology last year, and all of a sudden now the administrator said, oh, we have one extra section of chemistry. Oh, bio teacher, yeah, you'll be able to do that. We want you to, okay, well, you need to have some additional training uh, when you're dealing, obviously, with uh, chemicals and the like. That's absolutely critical. If you're brand new to the school district, right? You're a neophyte, you just got the job, you're in there, you need to be trained, right? And that training might be different than the veteran staff, right? Might be much more intense and the like. But the point is minimally, all staff must be trained on the updated chemical hygiene plan. Very important. So you know what's happening. And if you have an issue safety-wise, you know how to deal with it because that's the whole idea of having that chemical hygiene plan. Very good. Thank you very much for that answer. You're welcome. The second one is actually fascinating to me. I'm curious to hear your perspective. James and Dr. Well, never mind James and Dr. Ken. Dr. Ken. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> well, no, because I okay, I'll I'll put my two cents in after yours, but I'm biased. Oh, that would be a change. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. James and Dr. Ken, we have a teacher retiring at the end of December. This is not the end of the school year. And his lab is extremely full slash cluttered. I am concerned for the new teacher coming in that will inherit all of this mess. Do you have any suggestions for this problem? Well, that's a, that's a real life example there. I like it. Yes, you need to, first of all, contact the chemical hygiene officer. You also need to contact your department supervisor and you need to sit them down and tell them about the shared liability that they all have should that new teacher come in and get hurt or students get hurt in there because of the state of that particular laboratory that that new teacher has inherited. They need to provide full support. They need to have someone come in there and it's supposed to be hopefully the chemical hygiene officer and maybe chem teacher, whatever, uh, check things out, make sure there are no really bad chemical hazards or biological hazards. If they are, they need to be cleaned out before that teacher even comes in, All right? So again, in writing, involve the chemical hygiene officer, involve your supervisor, and then you need to share this information with the building administration. Now, if the building administration kind of just poo-hoos it, well then, hate to tell you, but then you involve your union and you go over the administrator's head and you go to the superintendent of the schools. And just basically, you're keeping them out of harm's way. You're keeping them out of a lawsuit, you're keeping them out of jail, and you keep them out of the front page of the local newspaper. Oh, no, that one will be the grabber. Trust me, that one will be the grabber. They don't wanna see any political stuff as a result of that. So again, you do have a responsibility if you know that that is the situation, even though it's not technically your lab, but that you're aware of it. You could be sucked into a lawsuit. Well, you know, hey, you're licensed. You're the one uh, that's supposed to know better. You should have told the administration. Don't want to be there. So you have every right to get out there right in their face and tell them, you know what? Totally unacceptable. Unsafe. And I'll take that to another level. There is no way if it is that messy, cluttered, disorganized, a hoarding zone, as you call it, <laughs> that any inspection that has occurred in the last year or years, that would have been identified in there as well. And that should have been dealt with a long time ago. That stuff doesn't happen in the course of two weeks. That is a long-term chronic problem. Now, there is a plan B. The plan B is, and I would urge you again to involve your union, if the school district refuses to accept responsibility for all of this, right? Plan B is you get the union representative to contact, assuming that you are under a state or federal OSHA or State Department of Health, whatever it is that you're under legally, uh, contact them, have them come in and do an inspection. Um, that really covers your butt. 
uh, to do that. And that you hate to do that. But sometimes, you know, administrators are blind, absolutely blind. And you're trying to save them. And they don't sometimes, you can't, just the way they are. So plan B, after you go through all this other stuff, and they're still ignoring it, plan B, get the union, call OSHA. If you're, under, if you're a private school, you're under federal OSHA. Uh, if you're a public school, more than likely you're under a state approved plan OSHA. Get them in there, explain to them what's going on, and trust me, it'll be cleaned up real quick. Well said. Very well said. Okay, are you ready for the, the third and final question? Sure. All right. <laughs> the, the, this one is a is a uh, a different type of, of question. Dr. Ken, our staff, so I'm assuming that would mean all of the teachers, our staff was given better goggles than the students use. Is that okay? Depends what you mean by better. They have to meet the ANSI ISEA standard that we talked about in the earlier slide, right? Um, <clears throat> that's the bottom line. So to say it's better, it might be fancier, or whatever, but as long as it meets that ANSI ISEA standard, then legally they've met the law. I mean, that's the bottom line. Um, Again, I know sometimes school districts are like it's a little more fancy designer designer goggles, as I call them. But again, have to meet that standard. And if the students, the ones that they buy for the students meet it, they're good. No problem. All right. Thank you so much for your answers. Very good. Well, everyone, that brings us to the end of tonight's uh, session. And we hope that all of you have a much uh, deserved, well-deserved, and a safer holiday season. Dr. Ken, do you have any final words for us tonight? Stay safer. <laughs> and Happy New Year. <laughs> and Happy New Year. <laughs> Very good. Thank you so much, my friend. Same here. Appreciate it. And have everyone, thank you for hanging in there for the length of this. And please take some action if you have some problems with some of the things that aren't being done, that are required to be done. Because remember, you don't want it coming back to haunt you. Teachers are the ones that are legally responsible for safety in the lab, not the administration. Don't forget that. Well said. Thank you so much. From everyone here at Science Safety, have a great evening and stay safer. Peace and love. Bye-bye.